Check one, two, mic check one, two. Let me just make sure that my, my audio is recording just before we start. Okay, it looks like it's coming in. It's perfect. Cool, 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 cool. How are you guys? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to today's podcast. All right, let's dive right in. Now, the world faces war uh, right at this time. The world is almost surviving an economic recession. The world faces rising sea levels that are swallowing up coastlines and villages. And at the front line of the world's toughest battles is tourism, offering a breath of fresh air. These were the words of Julia Simpson, who is the president and CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council, which is a forum for the travel and tourism industry at a global level. Today's episode is a rather unique one. <laughs> I will be, uh, it will be very heavy. <laughs> it will be deep. So I, I invite you to really brace yourselves. This, this is possibly for my really hardcore tourism guys. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be talking travel and tourism language today. For those tuning in on YouTube this week, I will be, I might be sharing my screen from time to time. Uh, hopefully my internet does hold up. <laughs> um, I might keep looking all over the place because I've got several screens open. I'm, I'm actually back at the desk today, so I'm recording this back at the desk. I do have my notes uh, right in, ahead, right on top there. Uh, that's basically just to make sure that we keep the podcast structured and also we are able to, to keep track of time. Then to the side, I do have the media, so I keep, on, I keep on looking to the side because that's where the media will be coming in from. And then I'll be recording the podcast right in front of me. Obviously, the webcam is also above there. But yes, welcome to today's podcast. And uh, if it's your first time here, it's always a pleasure to have you here with us. Now, this week I was just reading an article which had a quote from uh, Manfredi Dovido. Manfredi is the... He co-chairs, uh, he wears quite a number of hats, uh, but quite notably, he co-chairs uh, one of the leading tourism and travel brands, that's Abercrombie and Kent. And he said that travel and tourism-related services and experiences are becoming more like recession-proof, uh, for especially for the wealthy. And obviously, especially at a time when Europe is facing, call it inflation in double figures and is almost feared to go into uh, some sort of recession. Uh, but what rather intrigued me more was when he said that in the past there was always this correlation between the price or value of shares on the stock market vis-a-vis -vis the willingness of wealthy people to spend <laughs> because many of them were retired people who had put uh, a lot of their retirement savings in stocks. Now it, it, he says it is totally dislinked, which is shocking today. Because even if uh, the shares go down, travel consumption seems to continue to go up for the wealthy. Uh, and, and obviously, so do the rates for airline tickets, so do the rates for um, holiday destinations. Which is quite interesting, um, especially at a time when most companies, especially in the space of tech giants, are laying off workers in what is said to be induced by a looming economic recession. Uh, we might be talking about companies like uh, Netflix, uh, I was reading Twitter, uh, obviously with Elon Musk taking over, it seems to be a huge exodus of employees at Twitter. Uh, companies like Shopify, companies like Meta. Meta is the holding company for Facebook. Uh, but even other companies like JP Morgan and uh, Walmart and several others that are having to lay off staff because, as they say, uh, economic, term, economic times are tough. This seems to also be happening with uh, in the media space as well. I think it was this week that I was also reading that uh, CNN did send out a memo to their staff. And I think NBS, back here in Uganda, NBS, uh, rather Next Media, which is a holding company for NBS TV, were also letting go of some staff. Indeed, the times are certainly tough and uh, the belt is to be tightened on savings and expenditure. Although, uh, uh, quite quite shockingly, Manfredi Dovido, 
seems to still say that regardless of what happens, travel will continue, especially for the wealthy. Anyways, that was just me letting you in on some of my reading <laughs> this week. But away from all the mumbo jumbo, we've had some amazing and amazing, amazing pod, uh, conversations on the podcast in the recent weeks. And I've been extremely fortunate to speak to some really remarkable and awesome people on here. But a couple of weeks ago, I received a media invitation from the head of digital at the World Travel and Tourism Council. The invite was to attend the 22nd World Travel and Tourism Council, which is a global summit that took place uh, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia this week. Uh, obviously, I was to join as a guest, <laughs> as, a, as a virtual guest. Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't fly to <laughs> Saudi. Uh, but, but, but for me, the summit, like many such events, is an opportunity to meet, uh, but also to listen and interact with players in the travel and tourism industry at a global level. This year's global summit was particularly uh, interesting uh, for me on so many fronts. Uh, obviously, there was a whole lot to learn from the host, uh, who is Saudi Arabia, who, oh my God, put up an incredible, an incredible event. And I'll come back to all the many things that I found awesome about their delivery of the event. But the event being the first global uh, summit after the pandemic presented a whole rich wealth of discussions around uh, various pertinent issues that were shared by some of the biggest names in the travel, in the global travel and tourism space. Talk of folks like uh, Zurich, uh, Zurich who is the Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Uh, at, the, at the summit, we had uh, Anthony Capuano, who is the CEO of Marriott International. Uh, we also had Christopher, Christopher Naseta, uh, Naseta is the president of Hilton International. Uh, Stephen Shah from the Hearts Group was there. Uh, Federico Gonzalez, uh, the CEO of the Radisson Hotels. Um, several tourism billionaire, billionaires as well, including uh, I, I did see Pansy Ho was there. Pansy Ho is a notable Canadian Ch Chinese who I believe invests largely in, uh, in uh, casinos. Uh, and then obviously Manfredi Dovido was there as well. Uh, he chairs the Heritage Group and also co-chairs uh, the luxury travel company Abercrombie and Kent. Now there were also several panels uh, which were moderated by some of my personal favorites. Uh, some notable, notable names in journalism including CNN's Richard Quest, who you might know from Quest means business. Uh, we, th there was also amazing BBC's, uh, BBC's Zainab Badawi. And then one of my personal favorites from CNBC, Hadley Gambo. Um, the, the two-day the two event was moderated by Maria Ramos. There were also special appearances from uh, notable global figures, uh, including uh, Ban Ki-moon was there, who is a former UN Secretary General. Lady Theresa May, uh, formerly the UK Prime Minister, so made quite a passionate uh, uh, speech about climate change and also how uh, nation states handled the, the, the COVID crisis. Uh, Dr. Pindi Hazara Chana, who is the Minister of Tourism in Tanzania, was also there, uh, as well as Minister Lindiwe Sisulu from South Africa. Uh, but but not to forget that uh, I shouldn't also forget that uh, really awesome uh, presentation by filmmaker and actor Edward Norton, who uh, talked about his work with the Kenya Tourism Board. So overall, it was a fantastic summit. <laughs> really incredible messages went out, and I will be breaking down my key ten highlights or call them lessons from the whole summit after the short break. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome to the Jonathan Benaya podcast, a show that is wild, very wild. We try to put out a new episode every Sunday with discussions ranging around how to make the natural world a better place, creating awesome images, telling stories with words, wildlife films and photography, with occasional musings on sound and tech. Oh, 
I do share a lot of my own personal experiences and from time to time I'll have one or two guests on the podcast to share some insightful discussions. If you are fascinated about the natural world, especially natural history films and photography, environmental conservation and African travel at large, this podcast will have you in a spin. So thank you so much for tuning in and enjoy your time here. All right, guys, welcome back to the Jonathan Benaya podcast, where we talk about the earth, images, wildlife films and photography. We also do talk about travel and tourism and occasionally music. As I mentioned, we try to put out a new episode every Sunday, but due to some challenges, <laughs> largely technical, last week's episode couldn't go up and has thus been rescheduled. But thank you all for tuning in for those previous episodes. The metrics really show uh, that you all are enjoying, <laughs> you've been enjoying this. Uh, it gives me a lot of joy to read your reviews and hear from uh, from you regarding your thoughts on the topics we share and g- generally just feedback on the podcast. Uh, these have been coming in for a while and I think I will perhaps <laughs> from time to time begin to spotlight some of your messages beginning with one that came in this week from uh, one of you guys and I'll put uh, I'll try to put up the message up on the screen for those tuned in through YouTube. Yeah, so uh, uh, th- this 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 reviewer said that hello Jonathan, I've been listening to your podcast a lot lately and I can't thank you enough for bringing the Ugandan wild to people like me. I miss being in the wild, so I look forward to uh, I look forward to all you can share from out there. Also, unlike most other podcasters, you don't talk over your guests, and that's refreshing. <laughs> you are doing an amazing job. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you do know yourself. <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in. It's really nice to hear that you guys are loving and engaging with the, with the podcast. Now, a return to tourism is happening um, uh, with global with the, the global travel and tourism industry reported that it's currently at 65% of what the industry was before the pandemic. That was in the years of 2018 and 2019, which, if you ask so many players, were, uh, could be considered to be two of the best years ever in the history of the travel and tourism industry. Now, this steady return has, has been way faster than most people had forecasted, uh, and it is testament to both the fragility, but also the ability of the industry to cope and heal at such an incredible pace. Of course, given the history that it's had over the years with all the crises, it's always bounced back. And you could say that the, 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 the obituary that was written on the travel and tourism industry was way too premature, <laughs> especially in the COVID period where there was all these doom messages about the industry. I guess that, that obituary was quite premature, uh, and we will all come to accept that the industry will always and always recover because there they isn't and there can never be a substitute for human, physical human interaction. And I guess that's clearly one of many reasons why our sector continues to recover at the pace that we are witnessing. Unfortunately, China is still missing. Uh, destinations, especially the big ones, are suffering from, if I can call it, a lack of China. <laughs> Across the board, uh, s- several uh, speakers, senior speakers at, at this year's World Travel and Tourism Council noted that a recovery uh, that wasn't really including China <laughs> couldn't be considered a recovery because China is a globe, the globe's second largest economy. Uh, speakers at the summit were mostly full of optimism about the recovery of the industry. Uh, but the final jigsaw seems to still be China, <laughs> who are still, unfortunately, undergoing COVID restrictions and even experiencing lockdowns in some regions. You might be wondering why China? Uh, well, China, first of all, as I mentioned, is the second largest economy in the world, and it might quite take up sec- first place very, very soon. Uh, Chinese travelers, when they travel, uh, they travel in groups. They do have a great effect on almost all nodes of the tourism value chain 
Uh, when they travel, they affect things like shopping, they affect the leisure sector, they affect business travel. And this is why they are such an important segment, especially for countries or destinations in Europe, but even African destinations as well. Now, if you didn't know already, just recently, the global population crossed the 8 billion mark. Now, that's crazy. And the forecast for 2050, which is well, less than 30 years away, is that we will be at 10 billion humans on this planet. And uh, with, with all this growing pressure of mankind, the, the pressure that we have on the planet, quite some pertinent issues uh, continue to arise. And this wasn't different from the summit. There are several uh, quite uh, pressing issues that were raised at the summit. So I think let's dive right into my highlights, call them lessons from the summit. Uh, and, and by the way, this, this will be in no particular order, so I'll just be going randomly. My hi first highlight was the digital appeal of the summit. And, uh, and uh, I really want to comment the WTTC and uh, WTTC and uh, Saudi Arabia for really utilizing technology to bring the summit to life and basically to spread the conversation beyond the physical hall in Riyadh. And uh, to best demonstrate this, I, I think I'll just quickly try to share my screen for, for those tuned in through YouTube and just show you a bit of what the portal that we uh, were engaging with uh, kind of looked like. Uh, let me see if I can pull this up. Ho hopefully my internet will hold up. All right, so yeah, the, the, if you've been to, if you've been to call them what, those international expos, uh, many a time the entrance <laughs> looks kind of like this. So this is what the portal uh, kind of looked like. Um, right above here, you can see several several sponsors. Uh, obviously, the beauty with this is that you can tap on any of the sponsors and you can see their teaser, or call it their, their advert for Ugandans Kalango. <laughs> uh, right down here is... Uh, inquiry desk or reception desk for for guys coming in and you could basically t t tap tap there and uh, send in a query uh, if you had that or maybe a comment uh, right here you could tap and see the events program and you could tap here and see the speakers but it even gets more interesting <laughs> uh, you have the auditorium over here which is basically where the summit was taking place where the live broadca broadcast of the summit was happening then you do have uh, the ex Expo Hall, uh, which I'll come back to in a bit. <laughs> What's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, video on demand, if I, if I could maybe just tap on that, is where they are going to archive all the, 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 the panel discussions and basically the recordings from the summit. And of course, it's in so many, it's, it's, in quite, it's available in a couple of languages. Um, if I could just go back. Uh, yeah, so, and then they also had the metaverse. Now, if you didn't know, the, this year's Oxford Dictionary's word of the year is metaverse. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know what the metaverse is, it's it's basically um, one of many technological innovations that are happening. Metaverse, I, I believe, is by Meta, which is a parent company of Facebook. And it's basically a virtual world, pretty much a replica of the present the physical world. Uh, let, me, let me just let me just open up the, the the summit's metaverse. So basically, what happens in the metaverse is that you have avatars, which are basically uh, virtual forms of us, <laughs> the physical humans, in a digital in a digital world. So it's basically a replica of what the the physical world is, but in a, a digital realm. So this this is what the the, the, the metaverse looked like for the summit. Um, it had several galleries. You could go to the investors gallery where you'd interact with uh, the several investors. So you could basically walk up to, obviously people have left the summit. That's why you don't see any people here. But during the summit, there was a whole lot of people along this trail. So you could basically approach someone and click here and have a discussion with them. Or you could say things like "Assalamu alaikum," <laughs> uh, yeah, being being in be, being in Saudi, uh, or, or you could just say "Hello." 
Um, and uh, if you looked around, if we just maybe just moved around, you can see there are several investor boxes here which you can approach to find out uh, about investment opportunities. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what the investors gallery pretty much looked like. If I go to the to, to the networking zone, uh, hopefully did my internet continues to be nice to me. <laughs> Yeah, that's fortunately it is not too bad. Yeah, so this is what the investors, rather the, the networking zone kind of looked like. Uh, you are able to move around and uh, these, these, these tabs are quite interesting because you could tap on it and join a voice kind of networking conversation. So there were, there were different uh, networking topics which you could participate in by just tapping on this you are able to join with your microphone and talk with some of the some of the leading global uh, f figures in the tourism industry uh, and again you could you, you could still w walk to any of the avatars or any of the other people joining the summit virtually by just walking to them and just asking a question or maybe introducing yourself blah 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 uh, if I could go back to the main stage, uh, just to show you how that looked like in, in the metaverse. So basically, like all the other all the other modules, you have the avatars. Yeah, so you can you, you can walk to any of the avatars and have a one on one. But right on the stage up here, uh, as as let, let me let me just zoom in to what this lady says right on the stage is where you, you you would get to experience what is happening in the auditorium and uh, uh basically the, the 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 speakers were also avatars <laughs> in the in the metaverse so whatever whenever they talked in the real time you could see them here also talking in the metaverse it's quite interesting that it gives you close to physical a close to physical feel of being in the hall at uh, at the World TTC Summit in Riyadh. Now let me just go back to the to the portal just quickly because I, I did say I'd, I'd come back to the Expo Hall, which I found quite interesting. Just the 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 overall layout of uh, how the Expo was displayed. Of course, you do like any contemporary Expo, you have the exhibitors, you have the exhibitor stalls, and you're able to tap. On any of the expo stalls, uh, but it even gets more interesting. Uh, if you let me let me possibly sample let me sample Marriott. If you tap on one of the exhibitors, you're able to visit their stall, <laughs> and uh, it's it's not just looking at the stall, but you're able to really interact with it. Of course, you have their social media here. If you tapped here, you it would take you to their website. Um, you can tap here to send in an inquiry or maybe request for a callback, uh, maybe share some feedback. Uh, right here is basically like a pull-up banner, so you can get <laughs> you can get the, the, their branding. Um, right on the side here is where they had their brochures. So you, you, you had the ability to uh, access some of the brochures on the side here by just tapping on them. Then you can also add them to your brief briefcase, virtual briefcase, and download them later. Um, it even gets more interesting. <laughs> right on the screen here, you can just tap and watch the teaser, or the trailer for this particular exhibitor. And uh, finally, you also were able to drop your business card in this fishbowl and benefit from a raffle draw, but also uh, get contacts get the business cards from the exhibit as well so it was a very nice way i don't think i've seen i don't think i've really seen a portal like this for an expo and and this this just basically speaks to how the digital digital transformation and digital evolution is really enhancing the ability to promote the ability to market in a much better way. So, so let me just get out of the portal and let's let's get back to uh, it's it's. Let me just yeah. Let me activate the camera again. Yeah. So 
uh, and uh, during during one of the panels, we we had uh, some comments from, I think it was the Bahamas Minister of Tourism, that's Chester Cooper, who said he is very optimistic about all these digital transformations in the travel and tourism space. But <laughs> obviously, like myself, he was not necessarily optimistic about the many bureaucracies that are happening. Yeah, so here's just a snippet from the panel that was moderated by CNN's Eleni Gyokos, in which Chester Cooper, that's Bahamas' tourism minister, did make some interesting comments. So le le let's watch that. In terms of uh, seamlessness, there is some work to be done uh, globally. Whilst I'm very optimistic about the capability of the technology, I'm not so optimistic about eliminating the bureaucracy. So there is little harmonization government to government. We've made some progress in terms of e-passports. We'll get to the point where there's global e-visas, but even down to the harmonization on banking levels. So you might have Apple Pay or Google Pay in the USA, and you may not be able to use it in the Bahamas, or you may have cash and go in the Bahamas. You may not be able to use it in, in the USA because the platforms aren't talking to each other. And I think we will get there, as we see with immigration policy, as we see with the harmonization of data protection laws, we also see with the harmonization of banking policies. The platforms simply aren't talking to each other. You can use a Visa or, or a MasterCard uh, anywhere in the world, and there's automatic conversion, but I believe it's only 20% of people around the world who have credit cards. I believe there's 50% who have wallets, but the wallets don't automatically convert. So I cannot go to the beach in the Bahamas if I'm spending real and buy uh, that lemonade as I, I forecast it. <laughs> At least not yet, but we will get there. Indeed, we will get there. Uh, on the same panel, there was uh, Jenny, Mo Jenny Mundi, who works with Visa Global. And of course, you did hear the Bahamas minister says that, uh, fortunately, MasterCard and Visa have made, have made the, the playing ground quite leveled because you can basically use your Visa card almost uh, in any country. Uh, obviously, you, you, you need, they call them what, a po point of sale machine. Uh, but, but there is also the, the ability right now to use your mobile device as a, as a digital, rather mobile uh, point of sale machine. So Jenny Mundi from Visa was there also talking about some of the work that Visa Global is doing in bringing down some of these barriers. I, I think we already have a fantastic, seamless global uh, capability yeah. there. And... Uh, uh, and, and you know you make you make a very good point that you can use your visa anywhere and and I think for us it's about trying to take more and more barriers down so that we can have this connected experience that you've so brilliantly brought to life so for example how do we work with transit in in many many cities and we're already in 600 cities but how can we help people just get on a bus and use that contactless tap to pay with a brand and, a, a, and they, they trust it, they know how it works. When you get off an airplane and you're traveling, you want to know that things are gonna work. You want yeah. to have those barriers taken down. It's like the Oyster card issue. Every time I go to London, I have to buy a new Oyster well, card. Well, you don't need an Not Oyster anymore. card anymore. Fantastic. No, you just <laughs> use, your, use your Visa card, you just tap a normal card, contactless, and you're on the tube well, it's about time, and isn't off it? to go. And 600 transit systems now around the yeah. world. And these are the things that make a, a massive change. Yeah. I mean, it seems very small, but those barriers are making, making payments a properly integrated part of that experience. So it's really seamless and really connected, um, I, I think, is a vital part. It is. It is a vital part. Now, just moving on, uh, my... Second lesson, we'll call it my second highlight. As I did mention in my intro, is that Saudi Arabia really put up an awesome, awesome event. And I, I must appreciate their general ownership of this particular event and basically how they communicated their many investment opportunities really stood out for me. It was done in a very uh, tactical, a very creative, a very effective way. Uh, it, it was only just three years ago that Saudi Arabia... Uh, pretty much opened up its arms and its doors to the world when they launched their very first tourist visa. And they've just added a transit visa just recently, which 
uh, I guess is aimed at facilitating more of that transit travel, especially uh, given that they are trying to develop this Red Sea cruises. The several cruises that are coming to the Red Sea in the Gulf state in the Middle East. So um, with this transit visa that Saudi Arabia now has, they are, I guess, targeting some of those numbers that are coming in on these cruise ships. It might also be interesting to note that they've since made an investment of 300 billion US dollars just over these three years. <laughs> and the fact that they brought together some of the greatest minds in tech, travel, innovation, and basically some of the leading names on the tourism space to help them develop this tourism industry is, is quite mind-boggling. Uh, they, they are building a futuristic destination, which they say by 2030, 2030 is going to be the top <laughs> destination of the world. And it is valued, that investment is valued at about 6 trillion US dollars. I might also note that as a result of the summit, just the summit alone, they were able to attract a total of 10.5 billion US dollars worth of new investments in Saudi Arabia. And this was from the members of the, the World Travel and Tourism Council. And this partly speaks to the value of bringing such events to a destination. I guess <laughs> if, if you work in the tourism sector, you do hear a lot about this uh, discussion on developing the MICE sector. MICE, for those that don't know, is an acronym for meetings, incentives, conferences, and events. Yeah, so uh, there is a, this discussion about the need to attract more and more and more events because... With, with, with these events come investment opportunities, with these events become, with these events come uh, this foreign exchange and basically the, the trickle-down effect that pretty much impacts on all these other sectors. When people visit, they book hotels, they pay for cabs, they, they eat food, and, and this basically has a cross-cutting effect on the whole economy. Um, yeah, talk, talk about events like World Cup that is happening in Qatar. <laughs> Quite a big investment that was made by Qatar to, 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 to uh, organize World Cup. Uh, but in the long run, it's definitely going to pay off in, in dividends for them. Talk about things like the Grand Prix. That's a Formula One that the Arab world continues to attract with a grand finale happening in Abu Dhabi every year. These are all targeted and curated steps that the Arab world is doing to attract more and more investment, more and more business travel. And they are quickly becoming a travel hub with their airlines that are uh, flying through the region. You have a travel hub at Dubai, DXB, you have a travel hub, tra travel, not a travel, <laughs> a travel hub at Doha in Qatar. Um, and, and, and this, I feel like, is just going to get better. But what rather stood out for me uh, in the many developments and the many investments that they've got going on is this thing called Neom. Uh, now, if you've not heard, uh, Neom, to me, sounds quite impossible. <laughs> but I'm most certainly confident that the Arab world, of all places, is, I guess, best positioned to deliver such a project that is insane. <laughs> uh, you know, ha having seen how transformative Gulf states, we we'll call them these uh, these Middle East countries, it's including Qatar, UAE, and Saudi Arabia, are when they decide to set out to do something. They, they, they definitely do it. And I have no doubts whatsoever that uh, Neom, <laughs> Neom will be implemented. Uh, but, but let me just quickly spotlight two of uh, several investments that are going to happen in this call it a futuristic destination called neom in saudi arabia uh, they're planning uh, to, to have this hinged largely on uh, technological innovation uh, but also bearing in mind several sustainable practices and uh, i guess one of the biggest points that they have is that they do have their people uh, the people at the core of all the development so it's it is meant to have a huge benefit for their populace or their, their citizens but also for visitors that visit so the, the first thing that i want to the first uh call it investment uh plan or investment idea that they have is this thing called the line and it's best explained in this video so enjoy 
a revolution in civilization is taking place. Imagine a traditional city and consolidating its footprint, designing to protect and enhance nature. The Lions communities are organized in three dimensions within five minute walk neighborhoods. Travel end to end in 20 minutes. Designed by world leading architects, the line is 500 meters tall, 200 meters wide, 170 kilometers long, and housed within an elegant mirror glass facade. The line is designed as a series of unique communities, providing equitable views and immediate access to the surrounding nature. At the heart of the globe's key trade routes, a place for commerce and communities to thrive. The line the city that delivers new wonders for the world. Indeed, new wonders for the world. Now, sorry for those listening to the podcast <laughs> in the audio format on platforms like Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Travelcasts, and those several other platforms. You weren't able to see uh, the visuals, uh, but, you, but, but if you went into your YouTube and just searched Neom, the line, Neom is N-E-O-M, and then just say the line, you would be able to see the teaser. Now, the other, the other investment idea that I, wa- that I also wanted to spotlight, out of obviously the many that they have for this futuristic destination, is one called Trojena, which is basically them um, bringing what you'd call uh, a world that you would not expect to exist in a desert. <laughs> Things like bringing a, a ski destination, uh, which would obviously require some snow. <laughs> uh, things like building um, a, a, a deep and, and, and wide lake to allow for people to have um, things like, uh, call them what, jet skis, um, several water sports, um, and, 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 and basically, Trojena is meant to be a mountain, mountain, mountain destination for hikers and several other adventure-related activities. So here, here's another teaser of what uh, Trojena might look like uh, in Saudi Arabia. Indeed, a journey to new limits. <laughs> it's quite quite an ambitious project. Um, yeah, just imagine all those activities in a desert. That's mind-boggling. All right, uh, l- l- let me move on to my third highlight. Uh, call, call it lesson number three. Uh, was uh, During the summit, they launched the first global environmental and social impact report, which is basically the first of its kind to exist, which shows that uh, with this report, we can now not only compare greenhouse emissions, uh, but also be able to uh, measure the the things like water consumption, things like energy use, uh, not just at a a destination level, but at a a macro level, call it the global level, which I guess is the first report of its kind that uh, measures the magnitude of the impact of the tourism industry at such uh, a global level. Uh, yeah, so th- 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 that was something that stood out for me as well, that new report, and I'd be looking forward to reading more in the future of uh, what impact the tourism industry continues to, co- continues to have on our planet, on, uh, on, 
the social aspect of the economies of different destinations around the world, but at a global stage. All right, uh, my fourth lesson, I'll call it highlight number four, was a discussion on sustainability. Now, if you know me, I'm passionate about sustainability. Uh, of course, having 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 gone through um, a, a, a training course on sustainability, but also just one who is really uh, passionate about uh, development that benefits the the, the, the the local people, development that uh, does not negatively impact on the environment. And uh, sustainability has become a big, big discussion on the global stage. Uh, but it, but it does it does make me cringe sometimes, especially when it is used as a buzzword by so many players in the tourism industry. Many people throw it around, but they don't necessarily understand what it means. I talk of people who say that, uh, if I could just give an example of people who run eco lodges and they keep on saying that we are a sustainable lodge, we are an eco lodge. Uh, but then, when when you go into their operations, you get to find out they 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 are not respecting just general basics like uh, offering or invest rather employment opportunities to the locals in that destination that they are that they they they've invested in. Uh, they are not offering opportunities to to for market to 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 the local communities. As examples would be like they are not buying even the simplest of vegetables from within the community, yet the veg vegetables are available in the communities. Um, you could also give an example of people who call themselves ecologists or maybe sustainable tour operators who are not having any contribution to conservation, no contribution to um, uh, preserving the natural world, and, and they still call themselves sustainable beats my mind <laughs> um, and that's why I say it, it makes it makes me quite annoyed when I hear so many people throw around ecotourism sustainability responsible travel without necessarily understanding what exactly it means now anyway just to go back to the summit when this discussion came up um, there were several commitments that were made by global movers in the tourism and travel space both in the in, in the private sector but also the government, officials that were at the summit, three key messages stood out for me in light of sustainability. One being the need to provide energy, uh, sustainable energy for the tourism industry, which would then mean that every time we switch on that bulb in a hotel or in a um, safari lodge, we'll know that that is being powered by sustainable energy. And this also reminds me of uh, this uh, call it a revolution that is happening by vehicle manufacturers to create electric vehicles. Talk of companies like Rivian, who are making these uh, electric powered trucks. Uh, talk about Tesla, which is well known in the in the EV space. Uh, yeah, so there's all this move towards sustainable energy, uh, which was one of the big, one of the three key messages that I got from the summit regarding sustainability. Then the, the second message was about uh, fast tracking, the need for governments to fast track innovations in uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, now, as I did mention, the aviation f industry has the biggest impact of all the players in the tourism space towards uh, the biggest contribution towards greenhouse gases. And if we are to meet the Paris commitment, uh, we need to get governments to really, governments and also fuel producers, to really com commit to the pro pro production of sustainable fuel. And uh, this would mean things like innovating electric powered uh, planes or call them hydrogen powered jets. Uh, we need to encourage governments as well to really incentivize people who are, who are innovating in this space of sustainable energy, sustainable aviation fuel. And then finally, the third key message that I got from this discussion on sustainability was the need to protect the world, uh, the natural world, that's the natural resources, the need to protect uh, the people, that's the local local people in the destinations, um, and, and obviously that's where the discussion on local communities really comes alive. Now I must, uh, I just want to pick on, uh, uh, there was this 
panel by moderated by one of my f- favorite humans on the planet. That's Richard Quest. Uh, on the panel, there was uh, Anthony uh, Anthony Capuano, who is the CEO of Marriott International, as well as uh, uh, Greg O'Hara, who is who works with American Express. Greg O'Hara is one interesting person that. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, I, I'll, 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 in, I'll, I'll encourage you to look him up and uh, just try to keep tabs with him. He he he's quite a very smart, very smart fella who um, often has some very useful information to share. So let's let's just listen into the sust- the sustainability discussion through um, the the eyes of both Anthony Capuano, the CEO of Marriott International. And then after that, we'll, we'll also hear from Greg O'Hara from the American Express. Not only for the planet, but as a business imperative, all the constituents that all of us serve, our employees, our guests, our investors, language about sustainability is no longer acceptable. Uh, ambitious goals and the ability to demonstrate meaningful progress against those goals is being demanded by every one of those constituents and the only way we can make progress against those goals is collaboration with the public sector. So you're feeling the heat on that? I wouldn't say the heat, I think we feel the imperative. It is critical. It's critical as, as temporary residents of the planet and it's temporary as bi- it's it's an imperative as business leaders because everyone we serve demands it. It did. More and more stakeholders in the tourism industry are demanding for more responsible businesses. They talk of tourists, talk of suppliers, talk of travel agents. Uh, the, the, many of them are demanding for the people that they work with to be uh, to rather respect these principles of sustainability and actually really practice. Uh, these principles. So now let's just hear from Greg O'Hara from the American Express as well. I think collaboration is important, but but you you can do a lot of great sustainability projects and ESG projects on your own as an investor. Uh, when we took Hertz out of bankruptcy in 2021, we became a first mover in EVs, right? And so we bought hundreds of thousands of EVs. Interestingly, Richard, those EVs rent for a higher number than the normal <coughs> internal combustion engines. People want them. They're willing to pay more for them. So for instance, you talked about the money. It's much easier for me to raise money for sustainability when I have examples of the fact that someone will pay more for a Tesla Model 3 or a Polestar or a GM or a Lucid than they will for uh, the corresponding internal combustion engine. Interesting. Now what Greg is saying, what Greg is saying there regarding EVs, EV is an acronym for electric vehicles. Um, and what he's saying is that clients are willing to pay a premium or more for EVs, that's electric vehicles, than they were for our usual vehicles, call them vehicles that have an internal combust- combustion engine, which basically are the vehicles that we all drive, <laughs> majority of us drive, uh, vehicles that run on gas, or if you are in this part of the world, we call it fuel. Uh, and I, I really like that this is already happening, even in the safari space. Just yesterday, I was scrolling through Instagram, and I landed on this post by um, one lodge, we'll call it a camp in, in Kenya. It's called Camp Iyazi. Uh, and, and, and basically, they are testing one of those Rivian trucks. And for me, although this might sound like cliche or <laughs> idealistic, it is, and and I will not be apologetic. It's going to be what clients are asking for in the future. It's already happening now, but it's gonna pressure is gonna get, as we say, wasa <laughs> in the coming days. You're going you're going to face a lot more pressure from the the, the, the future traveler who is asking for more, uh, for, for for more from their back. If they give you their money, what positive impact is? their back having on the environment, what positive impact is it having on the local communities? So the, 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 the debate beyond just your pocket, the debate beyond having, um, uh, call it what, better better positive impact on the, the globe, a better impact, positive impact on the planet. Greg also used the acronym, I think I heard him say ESG. ESG stands for Environmental Social 
and governance, which can also be called environmental, social, and corporate governance. And this is basically um, a yardstick to measure or screen investments that are based on corporate policies. And, and it is basically to encourage companies and uh, business owners to act more responsibly. Yeah, so that was a discussion on sustainability. Now, let me move on to highlight number five, uh, which is my, which we could also call my fifth lesson from the summit. Uh, uh, that was a discussion around the fusion between business travel and leisure travel. There is this new phrase that is used, if you don't know, uh, it's called blazer, <laughs> which is basically business travel uh, kind of fused with leisure. So you have people coming for business travel as their primary goal, but also um, uh, uh, doing an add-on of a trip, maybe to the wilderness, maybe a trip to raft the Nile. When they are, when their main purpose of coming to Uganda, for example, is just for a summit or a tourism or, or, it, or, or call it a conference. And this was best brought to life by uh, Stephen Shah. Stephen Shah is the CEO of uh, of Hertz. Hertz is an American car rental company. Uh, and there were also some comments from Sebastian Bazin, who is the CEO of Accor Hotels. Uh, this was another panel that was moderated by, again, uh, CNN's Richard Quest, which, which had some interesting comments. So let's listen. Well, there, there are interesting changes that have happened, okay? One is that you know, I don't want to say that we've completely merged business and leisure travel, because I'm not sure that's true. However, you know, there's flexibility of remote work, which gives a person an ability to extend a business trip and, and work remotely for other days. So somebody could be on a business trip on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then look to extend their trip through the weekend. That benefits everybody in travel. And, and the ability and the flexibility to work remotely has changed that dynamic. The acceptability. Sebastian, it's the, it's the, it's the acceptability. Because many, most of us in this room... By the way, put your hand up. How many people in this room have actually and successfully done a pleasure trip where you've gone for business and stayed on afterwards, either with your family or on your own, for two or three days and enjoyed a holiday afterwards. How many have tried and failed? And how many you don't want to admit it? How many don't want to admit it? Yes. Uh, Sebastian, again, the, the question earlier, do, do, do you have fixed assets? Business travel has never been so strong if you talk domestic business travel. Let's be very careful here. If you go for business less than four hour flight, four hour train ride, it is as strong today as it was in 2019. Don't really? go short, as strong. What has been impacted is long flight, international business travel, cross continent, which is tiresome, which is very expensive, 25% of those customers will be gone forever because they're going to start on Zoom, on digital. But don't go short, and there's another statistic. Over 30,000 large employees, corporation, they're going to reduce business travel by 4%. Underneath 30,000 people, organization, they will increase business travel by 6%. So you're saying the long haul is suffering more than the short haul, which the, is exactly... No, I'm, say, I'm saying the short haul is not suffering. Right, right, that, right. So that's the exact opposite to what we thought was going to happen because we still think of people going on curated longer trips to see multiple clients in different destinations. You don't meet client by Zoom, for God's sake. If you want a client to sign, you need to be authentic, you need to be a person, you need to charm. Don't do it on Zoom. You're going to be unsuccessful, my dear. Wow, some interesting comments from uh, Stephen from St Stephen Shaw, the CEO of uh, Hats, American rental company, and Sebastian Bazin, the CEO of Co Hotels. Now, th th they did mention something about um, meetings happening in the course of the week. That's Monday to Thursday, and then people taking holidays over the weekend and then coming back on Monday for the conferences which I guess is also a benefit for hotels. You know, when you visit some of these hotels, they're quite noisy over the weekend. <laughs> but when, if, if you have people heading out in the, in the wilderness, t 
taking those trips, they come back a lot more revitalized, a lot more energetic. But also it keeps hotels <laughs> a bit more quieter for people who come come over to book uh, during the weekends. It's, it's a lot quieter because the guests are out um, do, doing more with their lives and just <laughs> sleeping in hotel beds. Uh, and this whole dis- discussion about uh, the fusion between business leisure and b- b- business travel and, and, and leisure travel reminds me of my old days of working in, if you could call it, mainstream tourism. And uh, it, 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 the, the manner in which such events was organized really um, made me cringe. Uh, it was quite unfortunate because I felt like they were not... We weren't really effective in our execution of some of these events. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the private sector would be brought on board uh, way late <laughs> in the planning phase of the event. Actually, many a time, um, uh, the, 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 the guys organizing events would reach out to the two operators just a week to the summit to ask them for possible packages that delegates can participate in when they come. And obviously, knowing how people, how the travel industry works is that people plan months and months in advance, or even years in advance. So making uh, travel options or tour packages available to a delegate coming to a conference just a week to their travel is not an effective way to promote uh, those 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 activities to them and and oftentimes the tour operators would be on stalls uh, frustrated and really gloomy because no one was really booking <laughs> booking for those extensions and obviously many many a time uh, the delegates would re- return home with that extra buck that they could have spent in the economy if they got to know about some of these options way in advance i don't know if that has changed in the tourism space in uganda you can tell me, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that used to be the case back then. Uh, but we need, I feel like we need to attract many more of those business travelers by developing the mice sector, the mice industry. And then also just make sure that we are deliberately, or call it intentionally, uh, expanding business travel beyond just the conference room um, for the delegates to take and also book those experiences over the weekends or even extend their trips at the end of the conference because this is good for, for good for the economy. It's also good for us to uh, share uh, our vast, rich uh, resources in light of our culture, history, uh, rich natural uh, places, wild places as well. So that, that, that is one area that we really need. And, topic, and when I talk of this, I kind of, uh, my mind kind of open up, opens up to the reality that it is becoming more and more evident that people will take a lot less trips, but they will want those trips to be longer. Uh, if I could just repeat that, uh, people are, are going to take a lot less trips, especially if you're talking long haul trips, where people are flying so many hours from destina- from their origin country to a destination miles and miles away. They will be taking a lot less number of trips but they will want to utilize their time on those trips and this is where it is important that when they come we are offering them more options and just just a few options and this is why <laughs> quite a number of tour operators will agree that for someone that wants to do a 20 days trip um, they will want to combine at least three east african countries because i guess we we are not um, packaging enough or not developing our products enough to ensure that we're keeping that tourists in this, this in this destination and not having them wander around to <laughs> our neighbors and several other destinations as well. So that, 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 that's, that's one big point that we need to take home as a destination, that we need to develop tourism that allows for um, this new age of traveler who wants to come utilize their time because they don't have uh, in a while they might not be able to do more than one trip a year <laughs> or one trip a or one trip every two years so when they come we want to maximize the time that they come be it if they're coming for business be it if they're coming for a leisure uh, a leisure a leisure travel and that that's where the, the money is made if we get them to stay longer they are 
uh, spending more in the economy, they are visiting more destinations. We are exposing more of ourselves uh, over the, of, over a longer trip than we are over a short trip. All right, I, I think I should put an end to this discussion on business versus business fusion with with, with leisure travel. And let me also talk about uh, my next, or we'll call it the sixth highlight from the summit, uh, maybe lesson as well. Uh, it was a discussion on human resource. And this is one of those discussions that really intrigued me the most. Um, obviously, sustainability and digital b being the other. Uh, it was revealed that more and more people left uh, and also continue to leave the industry, the, the tourism industry. Uh, basically because of the covid pandemic many people were laid off but also over the years the the, the tourism industry has not paid its uh, human resource well and we must admit especially for people that work in the in the hotel space uh, the the salaries that are paid vis-a-vis -vis the long hours of work is, is 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 one place for business owners to introspect of course, it, 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 the business owners will continue to say that the taxes are high, which is true. But I think this point this points to a need for um, both the public sector and the investors to meet and uh, forge out the best way to make working in the tourism space a lot more attractive. Otherwise, we're going to lose a lot more a lot more of that talent, a lot more of that skill as people wander off to look for better lives. <laughs> and I must repeat, we, might, we must need to talk in very practical ways uh, to solve this uh, particular problem. Now, the report by WTTC did reveal that millions of people have left the industry since the outbreak of the pandemic, including some young entrepreneurs who had invested in the tourism space. Um, and unfortunately, they saw the industry crumble at such a fast space where the COVID uh, pandemic broke out. So the question is, how, how does the industry turn into one that these, these uh, in small entrepreneurs uh, can return to, but also those workers that left because they were either laid off or because the working conditions were not favorable? How, 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 how are we making this industry more attractive to those people? Now, you must really admit that people will not enjoy working till 4 a.m., and then be paid pennies. And this is finally expounded on by Palace Resorts Vice President, that's Gibran Shapur, during this uh, panel that was moderated by one of my personal favorites, CNBC's Hadley Gambo. I think sustainability uh, has to be a balance between three things, environment, social impact, and the wallet of the investor. Because everybody speaks about green initiatives, but the investor will be looking at the, at the dollar in the bottom line. So there should be this balance between all of these three factors. Um, I'm not an expert in environment, but, but I believe that we do a very heavy work on social responsibility. We have 14,000 staff members in our company. And we're building projects that will employ more than 6,000 in, in the next three years. And those two projects are one in Dominican Republic and the other one is in Turks and Caicos. And something that we're doing in Dominican Republic, because it's a very heavy employment um, hotel, more than 2,000 rooms for 1,000 staff members, is that we're building a city because there's a lack of infrastructure. Uh, because nowadays people get transported two hours to work and then two hours back to their homes. So imagine being a 20-year-old single mom who's going to be taking care of your kids. So something important that we're doing is we're building 2,000 rooms, but we're building 2,000 apartments for the people to be able to live for free with their families. Along with these 2,000 apartments, we're building schools, parks, shopping malls, because people don't want to be just going to work and then go back home. They want to enjoy their lives. And, and, and the hotels make so much money, at least my competitors do, um, that, that we need to be able, I wouldn't say to share the wealth, but to be able to generate the wealth, to be able to pay better to our staff members. And I can tell you this investment is quite substantial. Uh, it's gonna be 20% more of our investment of the hotel. But in the end, I think 
we're going to make up that money really quickly because we're going to have less turnover, we're going to have better staff, we're going to have happy staff, and we're going to be able to charge more. So we're going to be able to make that money back. Up. So that's the, the way we, we see um, how resorts, how hotels, ships, and tourist companies could influence in the social uh, aspect in, in, in the destinations. And it is important to mention, and maybe it's not nice to hear, but I don't care, I, I just say it. We need to take care that tourism in world Third, uh, in third world countries uh, doesn't become very profitable for the owner and then modern slavery for the employees. So we need to take that in, in account, make that balance, and in the end, you'll make, uh, you'll make more money as, yeah. a, as a company. Now let me, just pause, let me just pause him right there. He says that by building a better work environment and making workers enjoy their lives on the job, business in travel and tourism, uh, business owners in, in the travel and tourism space are able to, one, create a happier work workforce, um, which would result in less turnover. Uh, the businesses will be able to make a lot more money and they will be able to pay their employ employees a wage that they deserve. And indeed, tourism, tourism in po poor, poorer countries, he also adds that po tourism in poorer countries I don't call them poorer countries, but less developed countries shouldn't make more. Uh, sh shouldn't be about making more money for the owner and the investor, while creating, he says, modern day slavery for the citizens. Those are two very strong points. Now, G Gibran also goes on to make another strong case for the future of inclusive tourism facilities or in inclusive travel. Uh, which, which I feel is well worth listening to, especially with uh, uh, this, this, this looming threat of a uh, recession, an economic recession that seems to be on its way. And also, we, we seem to be in an inflationary environment. So Gib Gibran does talk about uh, this all-inclusive industry, um, which, if you don't work in the industry, all-inclusive travel is basically... Um, where the, 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 the tourists will just pay one single fee and they'll, they'll not have to worry about any other expenses. Like, for example, if they visited an all-inclusive uh, hotel, they would, it's basically, uh, they would be able to have unlimited access to all services, be it the food, be it the amenities. Um, and then, of course, they get to enjoy their, their, their travel better than having to worry about, oh, I need extra pocket cash to, pocket change to uh, maybe cater for what, <laughs> what, what additional expense that might arise in the destination. So let's just hear him develop this point further. Well, um, it's going to have a boom. It has had a boom. If you see the amount of destinations that are becoming all-inclusive, uh, it's, it's growing. And I don't want to, uh, it's important not to confuse all-inclusive with cheap. Our all-inclusive resorts are $1,500 per night for two people. So that's not cheap at all. Um, actually, we're collecting the money, either they eat or not. So, so it's a good business model. Um, and I think that the people don't want to be, they're on vacations. They don't want to be feeling they're paying for this, paying for that. So, so we believe this is good. Uh, the all-inclusive model employs a lot of uh, staff members in a, in a hotel different to a European plan. And definitely I think it, it, it will continue to grow, not in cities because people want to go out, uh, go to different restaurants. But if you're in, uh, in, in Cancun, in the Maldives, <laughs> you don't have much where to go and eat. In Cancun, yeah, but Maldives, for example, no. So, so yeah, it depends on the destination, but again, you have to take care of the staff, and the staff will take care of your company. Interesting. Interesting comments there from Gibran Chapul, who is the vice president of Palace Resorts. Indeed, he says, if you take care of the staff, the staff will take care of your company. He also did mention that uh, one of the benefits of this all-inclusive travel is the fact that regardless of if of whether the the tourist consumes the many products is paid for or not 
the company is still making the, that money and they're able to then uh, employ more people to offer that all-inclusive service and also have a greater impact on the, 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 the local economy as well. All right, so let's move on to my seventh lesson. That's highlight seven. And uh, this was the need for product development and as, as well as the investment in the tourism infrastructure of destinations, which they said um, must be public sector led. Uh, but, but of course, it, it, it also allows for private and public sector cooperation. And then, of course, the, the, the discussion also involved uh, a general uh, chat about what investment trends are people looking for in the tourism space right now. So basically, around the question of what areas are people investing in. Just 10 years ago, if you looked at GDP, people were paying more on goods than they were paying for services. But that's since flipped over. It's now about 70% of people's expenditure goes towards services, while about only 30% towards goods. Uh, and of course, people are spending more on uh, things that are not <laughs> tangible, things like experiences, and a lot less on tangibles, <laughs> which used to be the case 10 years ago. Now, let me bring, on, let, let me bring back uh, Greg O'Hara, who is the interim president of the American Express, uh, Greg firstly presents a case for governments to the need for governments to invest in their tourism sectors. The, the Saudis have been absolutely committed to investing in their own tourism infrastructure. If you think about it, the world's going to change, right? You have all these developing nations who are becoming more wealthy. Where they're going to travel and how they're going to travel is going to be completely different than, than has. Saudi's making a bet on itself, and the rest of the world has to deliver travelers. That's our job to help. Saudi makes the investment, we deliver the travelers. Yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's a good point. Saudi and the Arab world is really investing in their tourism sector. Destinations that want to that really want to compete on the global stage have to invest in the in the in the tourism industry. It's no longer about how much you're getting from it. Uh, it, it, it is it is an investment like any other business, and governments need to be need to be held need to be held to account when they are talking about oh we are prioritizing the industry, oh we are prioritizing the industry yet not necessarily <laughs> prioritizing when it comes to the budgetary allocations as well. So, yeah, that's a, that's a strong point when Greg talks about the need to invest in the tourism industry by uh, nation states. Now, Greg goes on to develop a point on investment opportunities. He says that the return on investment is a lot less risky and it's more attractive when it's made in things like adventure, uh, in uh, tourism products like wellness, and basically activities than it is if we are investing in public physical things so let, let, let's let's just listen to his delivery of a point on investment areas well, you can call them experiences but but what the the consumer has is spending a higher proportion of their discretionary income on activities and experiences than they ever have if you look at gdp it was 60% goods 10 years ago 20% services. Now it's 70% services and 20% goods. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but travel is the prima facie beneficiary for that. So to answer your question, where are people taking their discretionary spend? They're taking it in activities, they're taking it in wellness, right? Like if you had have given me 20 more high-end wellness spas in Europe this summer, I could have filled them all, right? Um, I think you're gonna, you're, you, people are making decisions about travel based on what they want to do, not where they want to go. So no one decides I'm going to go to Greece or Saudi Arabia or Italy, and then I'm going to decide what to do. People are deciding I want to do these things. That's why Pier Francesco's business is so good, because he offers them all kinds of things to do when they get off the boat and on the boat. Interesting. Now, I think he, I think he meant uh, 70 versus 30 and not 70 versus 20. If I do the maths, <laughs> 70 versus 20 is 90. 70 versus 30 is 100%. All right. But, but I really like when he says that people aren't necessarily Googling or searching for countries, country names anymore, uh, or maybe looking for going into the Google search and looking for destinations. 
They are rather looking for what they want to do. That's, that's where the travel decision starts from. What do I want to do? And then they go and look for what top destinations would offer this thing that I want to do. And we must admit that this, this actually has been going on for a while, although he, he says it's, it's just happening now. Um, as someone that works, that's worked in the tourism industry for a while, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the truth that people are first looking for what interests them or what, what activity, what product they are really looking for uh, in the tourism industry. And then they go on to decide on uh, which destination is offering that particular product in the best way. And this now calls for us to develop, continually develop new uh, high value products for tourists to be able to, to book. Now, I must also mention that when Greg says uh, this thing about developing, um, investing more in experiences, the great mind that is uh, Richard Quest <laughs> goes ahead to ask him about the challenge of pe people duplicating this thing that seems to be working. You know, our sector is often culprit of creating a me too sector. Like basically people who see, ah, so-and-so has done this and it's profitable. So let me also invest in the very same thing just down the road. Uh, and then this this basically makes the whole sector really saturated. When, when Richard Quest picks on this, uh, call it the me too's, <laughs> the me too industry, which is very brilliant of him to pick that out. Uh, Greg responds in a very nice way. And this is why I enjoy listening to this guy. Uh, Greg, if, if you don't know Greg uh, O'Hara, I, 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 I want to re-echo my comment earlier. Please do look him up. Uh, he's one really interesting person to listen to when it comes to things to do with economics, things to do with trade and tourism. Uh, this guy knows his stuff. Anyways, Greg, Greg says that setting up... Uh, that hotel, setting up a hotel like a physical structure is often easier than building the economies around it. Um, and when we are talking about economies, economies are basically things that drive the, drive the sector. Apart from the structure, <laughs> the hotel um, that the investors put up, these economies that are, uh, are working around it, talk of tour guides, talk of people offering activities, talk of... Uh, uh, several service providers like tour operators, uh, maybe the cab, the, the, the taxi and cab industry, building talk of things like uh, community-based organizations who are offering um, produce, be it vegetables, food, food supplies to the hotel, but also offering cultural experiences to the visitors that come to the hotel. It's 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 more complex to build these this economy around the hotel to make this whole thing function that it is to set up a hotel. So let's hear what Greg says. The industry is brilliant at creating Me Too's. Yes. I mean, if that worked, we'd all better have five of them all on the same road sure. in the same tourist destination. Yes, so, so, so I think um, the, the little things are hard to do. The to getting scale in tour guides, getting scale in DMCs. It, it's easy to build, easy. It's easier to build a hotel than it is for, for all the, the trickle down industries that need to go around the hotel. That is very hard to do. I think you're gonna find that that billion dollars that you talked about gets allocated to those, to, to the, the It'll get allocated to real estate, it'll get allocated to giga projects, it'll get allocated to all kinds of things. But I think the main hard part is going to be to allocate around the activities and wellness, and wellness issues that go around those things. That's a big point. Uh, often, I call them the littler or the smaller, less significant players, but they are the driving engine. The, the, the driving engine of business to... All these other, all, all these other, and and the funny thing is that the tourism industry, uh, unlike several other sectors, is one that has comprises of a very long value chain. So you have so many players, and all these players play a very vital role in making this whole um, picture come together. Anyways, let, let 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 me move on to my eighth lesson. We we'll call it highlight number eight, and uh, this was a discussion on the community. And I, I know from time to time we've been hinting on people on the local community but there's a particular segment uh, during the the WTTC global summit that was titled community at the core 
Um, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like it's becoming more and more complicated for um, businesses to separate quality. Now, let me just explain this in a bit. Um, a, a while back, uh, it was quite easier to differentiate business offerings based on um, your offering newer cars or higher quality vehicles for a safari. So people people would use that as a bidding or, or rather as 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 a as a, as one item, one element to use when convincing a traveler to travel with particular uh, to, to travel with company so and so. But that's becoming that's becoming more complicated with more people understanding <laughs> uh, this cheat code called high quality. So people, many people are investing in high quality when it comes to the tangibles, um, and and, it, and 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 this has now created a, a, a dilemma of where now that the tourist needs to look for another yardstick for them to decide on what high quality means. And this is where important shifts to things like. Uh, what company what company values do you have as a tourism investor um, and and also the discussion on what force for good are you in the destination that you you've invested in uh, which I guess we can call <laughs> the new high quality more consumers are having to choose trips less because of the price uh, because of the price you're charging because in the previous times uh, a premium a company that was charging a premium would, uh, almost automatically translate into a higher quality product. But more and more people are looking for, more and more travelers are looking for what positive impact they are able to have if they spend their dollar through your company. What impact is their dollar uh, trickling down to impact on, positively impact on the environment, positively impact on the local community if they chose to book with your company. And I really liked how this point was developed by Matthew Upchurch, who is the CEO of Vatuoso. If you don't know what Vatuoso is, Vatuoso is one of the, might actually be the leading uh, booking platform for luxury travel. More consumers and travelers are starting to choose the product based on something other than the base quality that they're gonna get, like values, like show me, you know, show me what you're doing that's good. So from that perspective, but on the, on the perspective of, you know, when, when we talk about sustainability, we started working on sustainability storytelling 15 years ago um, and telling the story, putting the spotlight. It's not just about the environment, it is about local economies. It's about the people. That's as much about sustainability. First, as a private enterprise, we thought we were really good on DEIE, -E, -E, -E DEI. We've added the word, the letter B. We think that adding B to DEI is super important because that is the ultimate human goal. It's belonging. Everybody wants to belong. Our own employees and management team, whatever, we thought we were good at it. We have now added it as a defining objective in our playbook. Now that's interesting. He does talk about the local communities and then he also brings in his own staff who I guess also come from within his, uh, the, the area of investment, that's a local community. And uh, he also use, uses an acronym DEIB. Uh, DEIB was previously just DEI, which stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. But they've since added B, which is belonging. <laughs> that's where I guess he was developing a point about uh, making the employees belong or rather feel uh, like they benefit from this whole structure that you've put up as an, uh, an investor. All right, now, my ninth highlight was uh, during the same panel discussion that uh, Matthew from Vatuoso was on. That, that was a panel that was moderated by CNN's Eleni Gyokos. Of course, Vatuoso, as I mentioned, is a luxury, is a, is a, is a luxury platform. But then there is the argument of... Uh, uh, not everyone is traveling for luxury, <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the majority of the people, majority of the traveler, has a budget, has like a budget cap to how much they're willing to pay for a particular uh, uh, trip. And this is where uh, Desiree Bolia, who is the chair of uh, Value Retail Management, developed an interesting point on uh, SMEs, and this is my ninth highlight: SMEs. 
uh, the consensus, there was general consensus by delegates to support and really help SMEs, um, call them the small and medium enterprises, uh, be able to thrive because this is key for any tourism and travel industry in any destination in any country to thrive. The SMEs have to have to really um, uh, be enabled to operate if the industry is to is to thrive. Of course, Desiree does agree with uh, with Matthew uh, from Vatueso about uh, the fact that the quickest way to invest, the quickest way for an investor, is if they invested and targeted the high end traveler. That's the quickest, and if I could call it the easier return on investment. <laughs> If you target the, the luxury traveler, there's obviously more money coming in. And it's, an, it's a safer and more easier uh, uh, investment decision. But she also adds that travel is a tool for education. And uh, she, she, she brought on an element of the youth. Um, many more youth are looking for experiences away from home. Uh, but unfortunately, they, they do have a budget cap on how much they're, they're able to pay for those experiences. And this is why she says SMEs should be supported because the younger traveler will most likely book with an SME than they would with a, a big brand. And obviously, the younger traveler is going to be the future traveler. SMEs. SMEs are really actually, travel is a tool of education for the young, right? Education is a very important part to start discovering cultures. And the youth, when they start traveling, it's a way for them to discover new cultures, new sense of belonging, new stories, new... Actually, and they break down their entire prejudice. SME is where they're going to go. These youth, right? These young people have a certain budget to travel with. And therefore, young, actually, entrepreneurs in tourism that really have been bankrupt, it's sad to hear because they are the ones who are going to open their door for an entire generation discovering culture and travel within their own budget and means. And that's a way to be inclusive. And I really think I'm endorsing, and, you know, Matthew's... Mm, new initiative with WTTC because if we could help these MS SMEs survive, thrive, we have a whole new young generation that could travel and start discovering the planet and break down the wall of prejudice. Wow, interesting comments from uh, Desiree Bolia. As I mentioned, Desiree Bolia is the chair of Value Retail management. All right, now just moving on to lesson 10, or call it highlight 10, uh, was this discussion on smart cities, or call them the cities of tomorrow. Now, each time I read about or listen to panels on smart cities, a lot of this stuff feels so futuristic, <laughs> feels like uh, it is a scene out of a movie, and sometimes I feel like some of these things might be impossible, but with the many, with the many things that man has been able to do over the years, <laughs> if you told someone several years ago that we would be able to, uh, to, to to use a mobile phone to communicate to someone who is across the globe and be able to see them, they would call that witchcraft. <laughs> but the, 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 there, is, the, there is definitely no doubt to what the human, human, humankind is able to achieve if they set out their mind to do it. Now, when we talk about smart cities and cities of future, I, I get quite sentimental, though, because uh, when you look back at my city, where I come from, that's Kampala, uh, and then if you compare it to cities elsewhere, you 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 really feel um, quite sad, if I could say. I I, I don't I, I do I do appreciate the work that the capital city authority, that's the Kampala Capital City Authority (KCCA) is doing, and they have done over the years. Uh, obviously, there have been some advancements here and there, but I feel like this development is way too slow. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me or if I'm just over-demanding, but I feel like our development is like it's seated on the back of a, of a tortoise. <laughs> COVID obviously appended the way we live. Our cities uh, now need to be designed in a way that they um, 
offer purpose or the, they must be designed with purpose. Every city has, I feel, has a responsibility to be an access or call it a gateway to a destination. It also has a great role in uh, unlocking the true potential for its people, like its uh, daily dwellers, daily citizens, or people who live in that city. And if you are looking for some inspiration of where to look, <laughs> here's a bit of inspiration from um, the, 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 chair, the chairman of the Forbes Travel Magazine, who, that's Jerry Inzerillo, who is also quite closely and often consulted by the Saudi, the Saudi Arabia Crown Prince uh, for the many projects that they've got going on in the country. I really like uh, his argument about uh, de developing smart cities, uh, but also preserving the heritage of those cities. They need to develop smart cities. That's very important. They need to make things smart, but also to preserve the history, the, the history of the, our cities. Um, you see, the Crown Prince has a notion. Uh, when you work closely with him, you, you realize that almost every single one of his decisions, almost every one, boils down to what's the quality of life for my people. And if I'm going to be in a leadership position for many years, uh, what thinking can I put in place now that will preserve the culture, the integrity, and quality of life for me, the region, and the world where Saudi Arabia can be a role model? And why am I stuck with uh, what cities did poorly or what cities learned in terms of evolution? Very quickly, for Dedea, Dedea is the birthplace of the kingdom. It started 300 years ago. We're building a city now with 180 million mud bricks the way we did it. But underneath that, so today it can be a walkable city with great gardens and great paths. But under, underneath that, we have a whole infrastructure with new smart city technologies of water and fiber optics. We're putting 40,000 parking spots underground. We just, uh, in our first year of eligibility, were pre-certified for leads on a platinum level. So. What we're doing is we're preserving the identity, cultural richness, and authenticity of the interaction of people above with all the smart city below. This is, this is ingenious. And this point, we're a Giga uh, 2030 project. As you know, December 4th, we opened over $2 billion worth of assets in 2022. So those people who think that NEOM is aspirational, what the Crown Prince is saying is that we're starting our journey on the definition of quality of life now. So if we can prove that we can open assets in 2022 on a 2030 project, this, this, this bodes well for NEOM's future. I really like the notion on developing smart below and conserving the historical above. <laughs> Obviously, those are big budget operations, uh, but there are great projects for... Uh, other cities around the world to introspect. We don't we, we don't necessarily have to develop at the magnitude of <laughs> uh, big time investors like Saudi, but um, we, we 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 need we need to learn to even just get basic things fixed. Oh, don't don't, don't get me started about those potholes and the poor drainage system. Anyway, for for decency, uh, I I won't go any further when it comes to my runs on city development. Finally, perhaps one of the greater messages from speakers that uh, attended the, the WTTC Global Summit this year was this need for practical collaboration among nation states uh, across the board. If we are to further uh, advance and, uh, and develop the travel and tourism industry in the world, we need practical collaboration. But the COVID-19 period really exposed nation states regarding their selfishness. <laughs> and I'll end this episode with a quote from Manfredi Dovido, who, as I did mention, is the chairman of the Heritage Group and also co-chairs a uh, luxury travel company, Abercrombie & Kent. Of course, we could have seen the necessity to prepare broad capacity of producing uh, vaccines and uh, uh, because we were unprepared and the selfishness we were discussing with the minister the selfishness that the world proved in the last three years 
is amazing. Well, first, we think, oh, we're very good at speaking. But when there's a problem, let's take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, I think that this is what will change. <laughs> we're, Less selfish. As we said, we are a global world. And, you know, if we want to... The other people, the people that are on countries which are less developed, that feel that we are in the same world, yeah. we have to be ready not to be selfish when the right moment comes. And blah, blah, blah. Mm. Uh, it's, 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 it's detestable, we can say. Huh? Indeed, we have to be ready to not be selfish when the right moment comes. Those are very wise words from a man who has seen and done it all. A man who has seen this great sector, the travel and tourism industry, recover from so many crises through the years. Talk of the avian flu, talk of um, the, 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 call it what, swine flu, talk of the economic recession, talk of world war. He's seen the industry recover and he makes a strong point regarding the need for us to be less selfish when the right moment comes for us to be, for us to really um, demonstrate this thing we call collaboration. I, I think that's a very strong point to end my lessons and highlights from the summit on, and also a very strong point to end today's podcast on. <laughs> So yes, guys, that's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I enjoyed recording it. But before I sign off, I must congratulate my friends in Rwanda for winning the bid to host next year's Global Summit, uh, which actually will be the first uh, Global Summit by the World Travel and Tourism Council on the African continent. So it's only fitting that our host for WTTC 2023 Global Summit will be a country that has made great advancements in sustainable tourism and is now a true pioneer in the climate agenda. Our next host for the 2023 WTTC Global Summit is Rwanda. So yes, congratulations Rwanda and uh, congratulations Kigali. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to being back in Rwanda in 2023, at this time as a tourist. <laughs> so yes, Seth, Charles, um, Gertrude, if you are listening in, uh, please make this happen. 2023 would be great for me to come and visit Rwanda. And this time not for the meetings and conferences, but as a tourist to experience um, some, of the, some of the products that you guys have. All right, guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, go ahead and hit that like button. Share the link in your circles. As we always say, we need to expand this conversation beyond this platform. And then for those that just can't get enough and would like more and more of such conversations, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. The podcast, as I always say, is available on all major streaming platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Radio Republic, Pocket Casts, and this particular episode did run on YouTube as well. All right, I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>